welcome everybody to our talk today, which is being given by Susan Doram, who is a member of the Leicester Cycling Community. Susan has recently done a world tour on her bike. She got back not long ago, just before the lockdown, and she had many adventures, uh, which she's going to share with us now. So we're very privileged to have you, Susan. We've not Susan's a new speaker to Travel Talk, and we're really excited to have you with us today, sharing your amazing adventures with us. So thank you very much. Hello, my name's Susan Doran, and thank you very much for coming to today's talk. Thank you. Um, so this is me doing a cycle selfie. So I got back into cycling about 10 years ago. Um, I have to move this up. Yeah, I got back into cycling about 10 years ago, maybe about seven or eight years ago, I started cycle touring um, with a group of women. Um, let's see if we can get there. Hang on, one moment. Yes, can everybody see that? Yeah, so this is a group of my pals and they're from all over the, the UK and we've been cycle touring, I suppose, um, in the UK and in France over the past six, seven years. And so I suppose that was the catalyst that got me um, starting this cycle tour so back in 2015 i decided that i was going to go on a round the world cycle tour didn't know exactly um where i was going to go and what i was going to do but um in 2015 i decided i was telling everybody i'm going to go on a round the world cycle tour with my bike so this is my pals we're total women awesome tours and it's an afternoon you might know it's an afternoon. um so um funding preparation took me two years and part of can everybody hear me yeah yes. i think it's because okay. not everybody's muted their microphone so i think when people just move around it, it oh, okay. interferes so if cool. everybody could mute yeah. their mics i've seen to come out with pictures i forgot to say that could you please mute your microphone and maybe stop your video as well until we get okay so um, planning preparation started in 2015 and it took me about two years. It was decluttering my house. Um, the most important thing was rehoming my cat, which meant that for my first year, I was just going around asking any, any and everybody, do you want a cat, do you want a cat, do you want a cat? And it dawned on me that if I don't rehome her, I'm actually not going anywhere and I'm just going to have to stay in the UK. Um, but I finally managed to get her rehomed, um, managed to declutter. And the whole goal was to try and get everything into these four bags, as you see. Um, but it was all part of a process and it, it took a bit of a time. So that was one of my attempts, which, um, as you can see, I didn't actually manage the, the four bags there or so. So I actually left the UK on the 5th of June 2017. So this is my niece. And this here, if you can see that big box, that's the box with my bicycle. And this bag at the back here. Um, that's got my panniers in. So um, caught the plane and uh, left on the 5th of June. I was away for two years, eight months and nine days. So I came back this year, um, perfectly timed really on the 14th of February. So, um, so yeah, so I went to 15 countries. Um, this is a list of them. Some of them um, I visited more than once, um, as you can see. So the ones with times two and times three, I went to a few more times so after those the first country that i went to was canada so as you can see from the pictures it is absolutely fantastic beautiful scenery and um, the water is like a turquoise um really really clear so flew into vancouver and i cycled up the coast went to vancouver island caught a boat along the inside passage all the way up to Prince Rupert and then a train across to Jasper and cycled down to Banff and so in 2017 there were um, forest fires in um, in Canada and so the smoke got really really bad so and um, so I decided when I got to this part around Banff and Canmore I decided to catch a bus and go to Vancouver to miss to get away from the smoke because it was just really bad on my chest um, so this is an example of the smoke so you can see the mountains in the background and just the outline of the mountains whereas the day before it would have been really clear and um, 
also, to be honest, I did actually really struggle with um, Canada because um, my experience of cycle touring was in England and in France and Scotland and just my cycling experience where I was very much used to cycling and maybe cycling for 30 minutes or an hour and the scenery changing. Whereas in Canada, I really, really struggled. As you can see, um, it was just for days cycling down a road with trees on either side and a big mountain in, in front and not much um, not much of a change of scenery. So I think in Canada, I was like questioning what was I doing here and had I made the right decision by doing this cycle touring. So I got, I caught a bus to Vancouver and I cycled the Sunshine Coast. And this is where it all started to change. I started to meet different people. So there's something known as warm showers, which is where other cyclists host you. And so um, these two people here were different warm showers hosts. That I stayed with and it was it this was where it all changed and I started to meet people start to learn more about the country or just learn more about what different people think or so so the picture in the middle you can see that my bike is fully loaded so I've got my bags um with all my camping gear and a few clothes in it so um this was where it all started to change and I started to really 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 enjoy the tour so every day um when I was cycling because as you can see the previous photo so I've got a lot of I've got a lot of bags and every day I'd be cycling and thinking, OK, what can I chuck out? What can I chuck out? And I'd know exactly what was in each bag. And I'd mentally be going through my head, like thinking there's got to be something that I can chuck out. So every day I was always trying to not necessarily chuck out, like throw it in the bin, but trying to give it to somebody or so. So, so, so for example, this was a little stool that I had, which was really light, but it had to go. It had to go. And these were my bicycle locks. And, um, I got rid of the cable lock because cable locks aren't that great, but I did actually stick with the hot, the, this uh, key lock, which is like about two, two, kilom two kilograms. So every day I was always trying to think that surely I can, I can change the lock, but I did actually stay with that lock for the whole two and a half years. So after Canada, um, I went to America. So I caught a boat from Vancouver Island to somewhere in Washington called Anna Cortez and it was going through the Gulf Islands and it was the, the best entry that I've ever had into America. It was absolutely beautiful. And this picture is an example of um, some of the scenery. So um, as you can see, I did the West Coast. So it was a Pacific Coastal Highway that I did. And most of it um, was all along the coast. So I did go a little bit on inland and I stayed with a lot of hosts, um, stayed with a lot of warm showers hosts, met a lot of people. Did, a little, did some camping as well. So I met people along the way. And um, the beauty of cycle touring is you get to stop off at different places. It's, it's done at a slower pe pace. And so you get to notice all the, the quirky things um, around the place. So this was Raymond in Washington and it just had all of these iron sculptures all over the place. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I like about cycle touring. You get to go at a slower pace as well. So, as I said, um, where are we? It was beautiful scenery and I was on the coast. Um, but back in 2017, they had really bad forest fires in California. And um, I was at a place called Gualala. And um, that was when the fires started. And Gualala is about 125 miles north of San Francisco. And so I actually had um, had to be in San Francisco um, by a certain date because I was meeting up with some friends and we were having a reunion. So um, a friend from the UK was coming over and then I've got friends in San Francisco and we were all meeting up. So um, the fire started and before the fire started, I was on schedule. Um, but the idea of cycling through the smoke didn't appeal to me just because of the effect it would have had on my chest. And so that night I was at a campsite and I met this guy called John and he was saying that he was going to hitchhike and he asked me if I wanted to join him. And I never, ever hitchhike because obviously you're always told don't hitchhike, it's dangerous. And he was like, don't worry, I've hitchhiked from LA down to Argentina, we'll be fine. And I was like, but we've both got bikes. And he was like, yeah, yeah, we'll be fine, don't worry. And so we, we and he was like saying, because there were no buses because they'd been cancelled because of the, the fire. And he was like saying, 
And if we don't catch it, then we just come back. We don't get a lift. We just come back to the campsite tomorrow night and we try again. Um, and so we did, we did actually manage to get a lift um, and down, down to San Francisco. So this is John here. And this is Janice, and she'd never ever picked up hitch, uh, hitchhikers, um, but because she was escaping the fires herself, and this is a truck, and she was carrying everything in there, and um, we managed to squeeze our bikes in there, and she took she took me to my friend's house. She took me 125 miles outside my friend's house. Um, so that was also part of the journey, where it was just meeting people who, it, it, it was just everybody's kindness really all along the way. And so, as I say, I managed to meet up with my friends. Um, this is my friends. We, we all went to university together. And it's been 29 years since we've all been together. So it was nice to catch up with them. And then when I was in San Francisco, Cisco also met up with Yusek, who's on the right. He's from Japan. And Clara, she's, um, she's from the East Coast of America. I was absolutely um, in awe of Clara. She was only 20. And she cycled from the east coast of America to the west coast on her own. She'd, she'd never done it before and she just decided to do it. And this is her bike in front of her, um, which must be about 20 years old. And so she just picked up a bike and just cycled across. So um, I was absolutely impressed with that. So um, let's see what's next. My highest climb was in uh, California. So the highest climb that I did in that whole journey was in California. And it was 1,065 meters. So, um, so yeah. Next up was New Zealand. So after America, I went to New Zealand. So the women that I'm with here, they're the Mercy Sisters. Um, I know the woman at the back, uh, Sister Monica. She from Tonga. So, um, I 25 years ago I taught maths and science in Tonga in the South Pacific, and one of my reasons for going to New Zealand was to to meet people that I hadn't seen in years. My my whole journey changed from being a tour to cycle to discover places to actually being something where I would meet people that I hadn't I hadn't seen in years or meeting new people. So um, this is the these are the Mercy Sisters and I met them in Christchurch. Um, so I started off in the South Island and I caught a bus over to the west and cycled down the west coast of the South Island. And um, I'd always wanted to go to the South Island of New Zealand. So um, this was, it was good that I got the chance to do it. The South, the West is very, very wet and very, very green. And I was really lucky in that I only had one day of rain when I um, cycled the West Coast. And with New Zealand, there's a whole route. So you can cycle from, the top of the North Island all the way down to the South Island, um, to the to the bottom of the South Island. A lot of it is um, off route, off road, um, and if you've got a mountain bike, um, you'll be well suited. Some of the routes weren't suitable for my bike, so in some cases I ended up having to go onto the road. So as I say, there were routes and they were signposted, and it was really New Zealand is absolutely gorgeous. It was really really beautiful. And um, there was one day I was cycling along and I saw this woman coming towards me and we both said hello to each other. And as we passed each other, we both stopped, looked behind each other. And then I realised it was Margaret. Margaret, I know from Leicester. She's actually from New Zealand. I know from Leicester. And um, she, uh, she comes on my bike ride that I would lead back home in the UK. And so the chances of bumping into somebody that I know who happened to be back on holiday in New Zealand um, on this really isolated route um, was absolutely amazing. So as I say, New Zealand was absolutely fantastic scenery. I loved it for the scenery. The one thing that I was told about New Zealand before I arrived was that New Zealand is a really nice place for people. It's really lovely um, and beautiful. And Rachel, who's here, can vouch for it. But they're terrible drivers. They're absolutely awful. Um, when it comes to cyclists. So I had a lot of New Zealanders saying um, it, it was the Asians, absolutely awful thing to say, it was the Asians that were, that were the awful drivers, but the people who were shouting at me to get off the road actually had New Zealand accents. So um, although it was a beautiful country, I didn't really enjoy the cycling experience, um, but it was fantastic scenery. 
So I also went up to the North Island and tried some Vipassana, I'm pronouncing it wrong, meditation. So this is a 10 day course of meditation where for 10 days you don't actually talk to anybody. So um, when, I, I, in, when I was in America, I went to Hawaii and I met this woman who's um, from Canada who was telling me about this 10 day meditation course and it was the best thing ever and it, it had changed her whole perspective on everything and it really hooked me in. And she started talking about it and I was just like thinking, oh, that sounds really interesting. The whole idea of not talking to anybody for um, 10 days. Um, and I was wondering whether I'd be able to go so long without talking to anybody. But when she was talking about it, I was thinking, ah, but something like that is going to cost a lot of money um, because it included your accommodation and food and things like that. And you didn't have to do anything. Um, and then when she said it was free, I thought I've got to try this. And so I managed to register and get onto this one in New Zealand. And um, this is a picture of where it was, and it is absolutely beautiful. And um, there were certain things that they did where you had to, um, no tight clothes, um, no short shorts. Men were kept separate to women. Um, so men and women, we dined separately to the men. Um, in the meditation hall, women sat on one side, men sat on the other side. Um, if you had any problems, you had to, I had to speak to the woman manager who would then speak to the woman di um, assistant teacher. So it was all kept very separate. And, um, and there were things of it that, although it wasn't supposed to be religious, there were just things to me that just smacked too much of, of religion. So it didn't sit too well with, well with me. But the whole not talking to anybody really, really appealed to me. And I was really surprised because I turned up and there was about a hundred people there. Um, and the food was amazing. The food was absolutely fantastic. Um, and not talking to people was actually really quite, I quite enjoyed it. Um, just, um, yeah, just not having to interact with people. When you meet a group of, if you're in a group and there's a hundred people, you've got to, and it sounds awful, you've got to do that small talk. You've got to do that chit chat and it was really nice not having to do it. I just struggled with aspects of it that just seemed a bit too much like um, a religion. So after, after four or five days, I had to leave, I escaped. Um, and, the day, and so on the day that I was leaving, I made the decision I was going to leave because um, I spoke to the assistant teacher. Um, I had to speak to the manager and then the manager made an appointment for me to see the assistant teacher. I went into the room with the assistant teacher and she told me to sit down. So I sat down on the floor while she sat a little bit higher up on the plinth. There was this whole sort of hierarchy that didn't sit well with me either as well. And um, I, I managed to leave. And at the same time I was leaving, I left at the same time as this woman from Argentina. And it turned out that she actually tried leaving um, about two or three days before, but they were pressuring her and telling her, well, we promised that you would stay. And they put a lot of pressure on her and made her stay stay longer than what she really really wanted to. So it was interesting. I would, I mean, if any, I would always say to people if they want to try it, you should try it. But obviously, it wasn't for me. But it was a great experience, and I did enjoy it. So after New Zealand, I went to Tonga. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I taught maths and science in Tonga in the South Pacific. Uh, yeah 25 years ago and so I've always I've always wanted to go back I've always like in the years that I've been working since I've sat at my desk thinking I wonder if I'll ever get to go I, I'd really really love to go and so I actually did I actually did go so um this photo on the left is me with my friend's children after after church because the best thing about going to Tonga is that I knew that they were going to dress me up in their traditional traditional clothes and then um, the photo on the right is me with a little boy. Um, I'm tickling him, so he's trying to run away. But we're standing on something known as kappa, which is from the inside bark of a tree. And um, they, make, they decorate this and paint it. And it's used a lot in um, a lot of their funerals and weddings and a lot of their ceremonies. So, um, so yeah, so um, I managed to go to Tonga. And Tonga is this little island. Let's see if I can... Um, in the South Pacific, if you can see right here, that's Tonga. So Australia's there, New Zealand's there, and that's Tonga. It's a group of 100 islands, 
um, and most of them are uninhabited. So I went to the main island. So this is a photo of my students. These are my students 25 years ago in the traditional dress, in their school uniform, and also just in their casual wear. Um, so it was nice to go back. It was, this was my um, science lab 25 years ago. And so it was nice to go back just to see how things had changed. And this was my science lab, um, how, it, how it was when I visited two years ago. So um, when I was deciding whether to go to, when to go to America, to Tonga, it was trying to decide how long to go for. I could have gone for it up to a month, but I decided to only go for, for two weeks so that I'd make the most of it. And so during my first week, I was meeting people, making appointments, um, arranging when I'd come round for dinner, uh, and especially like walking around the village. And a lot of the students remembered me, and I was getting all these invites for, for dinner. And so I went in February, which was their, which is their windy season. But this year, they actually had their worst cyclone in six years. So um, all of those appointments and arrangements that I made for my following week in Tonga got cancelled um, and these were a few examples of the, the cyclone and instead I spent it with my friend at her house um, just seeing being reminded of all the traditional things that they they would do so it was a nice and um, it was that was just so fortuitous I was only there for um, two weeks because obviously with the cyclone the cyclone brings water and which will increase the mosquitoes and increase the chances of dengue fever and so there was an increase in dengue um, after I left. So um, this is just Soana and her husband making a broom from the coconut, coconut leaf. So after Tonga, I went to Australia. So I only cycled this little bit. If you see the little yellow stars, I only cycled this little bit, which was um, Sydney down to Canberra, because I had friends in Sydney and I had friends in Canberra, so it was nice to cycle down and, and meet them. And it was all along the coastline. And it is absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful coastline in um, Australia. And Australia was a real pleasure to cycle in um, because they have something known as a meters matters. It's a new law that was brought in where um, if you're going at a certain speed, you need to give the cyclist at least a metre. And if you're going above that speed, it's, I think it's something like a metre and a half or two metres. And it did make a, um, a big difference. It made the whole um, cycling experience um, far more enjoyable. So this is me. Um, so Australia scared me initially. Um, I wasn't too, when I was in New Zealand, I was worried about going to Australia because everything is poisonous. Um, I was like, but there's poisonous snakes, there's poisonous spiders. And I have been to Australia previously and I did see a snake. So it did, it did worry me. So it was trying to find out more how to camp, like putting your shoes in the tent and everything like that. Um, but turning up for campsites, and it was the same in, say, places like Canada, um, turning up for campsites on my own as a solo, solo female cyclist. Um, people have all of this concern. And so they're always offering me food. So like in the mornings when I was in um, Australia, I'd wake up, pack up my tent, make myself um, porridge and breakfast and um, be ready to go. And then somebody would be like, oh, do you want some sausages and bacon and eggs or so for breakfast? And so I'd, a lot of times in, um, in Australia, I'd, I'd get um, a second a second breakfast before I set off on, on my ride. So everybody is really, really uh, friendly and the campsites are really nice. And as I said, I cycled along the coast and the scenery was beautiful and getting to see wallaby, this is a wallaby, but kangaroos just lazing in people's gardens uh, was, and koalas and their birds are beautiful. The wildlife is absolutely beautiful in, um, in, Can in, in Australia. So after Australia, I was in I was in Australia in May, and so the next point point of call would have made sense to have gone to Indonesia. But in May at the time in twenty yeah twenty seven twenty oh twenty eighteen no yeah coming up to twenty eighteen so coming up to a year um, it was Ramadan. So um, had I gone to Indonesia, I would have only really been limited to really touristic places because. It, a lot of places would have closed down during Ramadan except for in the evenings. So I decided to fly to 
Singapore instead. So um, also, um, I, so I've never been to Singapore before. So flew to Singapore, and then as you can see, this is a route that I did. I took, I went along the west coast um, because the east coast, um, it's there are less villages. It would be longer distances to ride, and um, as it was Ramadan, there's a larger Muslim population along the east coast, so it would again be hard to to find food and places to eat. So to Singapore, and um, Singapore is is what you imagine it to be, which is absolutely pristine with its high-rise buildings. It's, of course, the the hotel with the swimming pool on the top and the Bay of Gardens. And so there's even though it's it's green and it's high, it's all, even though it's small in its high rises, there's so much greenery. Um, I ended up being going to Singapore three times, and um, just because it's a travel hub, and getting lost a few times, especially getting lost on the expressway as well, and then just getting lost in places and just finding more greenery around the place. And it was just, it was nice at night time. It was just so safe. So um, I didn't have any worries about walking around at night time on my own or so. I felt very, very safe in, in Singapore. Very clean and a great place for cycling. I, I enjoyed the cycling there. So um, going from Singapore, I went to Malaysia. And so I was there during Ramadan and Eid. And so I stayed with a family. Um, I stayed with a family. Um, they were couch, through couch surfing, so a similar sort of thing where to warm shower where people host you. And um, it, so I was there for the a weekend and it was Eid, it was just after Ramadan. So during Ramadan, you can't get married. So it was the first weekend after. So I got to go to four weddings um, that weekend, which were quite basically the, the family taking me there and getting me fed with um, loads of food. So the bride and groom are in the middle there and you can see that um, traditionally yeah they're, they're wearing matching um, outfits so it's matching colours and that's that's I was told was a tradition that they wear matching outfits and so I met these guys they were from Malaysia and they were cycle touring around um, the, uh, the country so I met them I remember that day I was trying my hardest to um, try and catch I was so tired and I think I was trying to catch a bus somewhere, but I really didn't manage to try and get a bus to get to my next destination. So I remember having to do the, I think the, the 40 or 50 miles that I really didn't want to do. Um, and then the, the thing, I really, really enjoyed Malaysia. I think I went to Malaysia three times and um, a lot of the cities, there's all of this artwork all over the place as well. So I see, okay. And the thing that I like about Malaysia, was that the smile reciprocation rate was, was high. I would play a game where it, it, my whole game with a lot of my cycling on, on days where I was on my own was to just try and see how many people I could get to smile. And Malaysia, M Malaysia was one of the countries where um, people would always smile, smile back or um, they, you would get people saying um, welcome to Malaysia. It was just um, the whole friendliness of everybody there that I really liked. And so this is uh, so 10 years. This is a photo of me 10 years ago in Jordan. So 10 years ago in Jordan, I went on a cycle tour with a company called Exodus and I actually sprained my ankle. And um, after I came back and I recuperated, I never, ever had any problems with it until I got to Malaysia and I started to have problems with it. Um, I, and tried to, and it was really really hurting me I thought it was a kill it, I thought it was my Achilles tendon and then I started to work out it was from this it I, I I mean it had healed so well that I couldn't actually remember which ankle it was that I'd sprained in all those 10 years and then I started to realize it was because of this so I ended up spending a good two months in Malaysia at one point having physio um just getting myself uh, sorted which was good and so I stayed at this hostel in this place called Moi, um, which wasn't touristically touristic at all. And so it, it, it was just nice to spend um, two months there getting to know Lily. And I was there during uh, Chinese New Year, so going to her family and spending time there. So I can see 
Uh, are you there, Peter? Yeah. And so the frequently asked questions that I got were, um, where do you come from? Um, and this was in a lot of countries where people would stop me and um, ask me where I came from, or they would stop the traffic. Sometimes people would stop the traffic and they'd ask me where I came from. Then the other one was, how old are you? And that was quite a funny one because it was sometimes trying to explain to people that's a little bit of a rude question. Where, where I'm from, that's a bit of a rude question. And the next one is, um, where is your husband? So these are the frequently asked questions that I got asked a lot of the time. So after Malaysia, I went to Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So I'm Peter and Fisher, are you there? Or you can't hear me? Yes, we're here. Oh, we're here. Isn't, I'm yeah. wary of the time because it's five. We've got five minutes left. Um, yeah. Yeah. So should I? Do you want to carry on? Do you want to keep going a couple of minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. I'll I'll carry on. So after Malaysia, it was Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. I went to Thailand twice. Um. So, and um, the second time that I went to Thailand, I taught. I became a. I taught English and science so I qualified as a TEFL uh, teacher in Thailand and so this, these, I taught it to primary school um, children which quite surprisingly I actually really enjoyed I, I thought that secondary might have been um, more what I would have enjoyed but I actually enjoyed it and this was my form class um, this is me and one of my students Maple and as you can see we're wearing matching outfits so um, in Thailand um, the teachers would wear a uniform as well as the students and the uniform would change depending on what day of the week it was and so this was my favorite because it was just like wearing a pair of pajamas on a friday it was really really comfortable and um these were my pals that i met on my course when i was doing the tefl course so um these are the guys that i met um whilst doing my tefl course so after thailand ah, and the thing that i loved about thailand and also most of southeast asia was just the topiary. It was just topiary everywhere and just so nicely done. And obviously the temples were just so beautiful as well. So um, my longest um, distance, longest ride was in Thailand and that was 66 miles. Um, and it was a hot, hot day. It must have been mid thirties. Um, just, and it was, luckily it was a flat road, um, but it was really, really hot. And I remember stopping somewhere and buying some water and drinking it really, really fast, and then going to buy another bottle of water. And the woman just must have taken pity on me and just gave me the bottle of water or so. So that was my longest ride. Um, whenever I cycled toward, I always tried my hardest to not do too far. 60 was my maximum that I would ever, 60 miles was what I, maximum I ever wanted to do. But ideally something like 30 miles was preferable because then you get to stop and stare and you have time to relax and talk to people or meet people. So. Okay, fantastic. So um, after, what did we, I just did, so after Thailand, so Thailand, um, so Vietnam, um, Vietnam I cycled from Ho Chi Minh in the Mekong Delta to Bangkok um, going through Cambodia. Um, the best part of this was that it was flat. Um, Vietnam, I absolutely loved. Fantastic food. Um, the traffic was absolutely mad. Um, scooters everywhere, and they drive on the right hand side. So, having been in Malaysia and Singapore and Thailand um, and Indonesia, all the, the Vietnam was on the right hand side. And with all the scooters, it is quite basically you just drive, you don't look over your shoulder you just drive but it actually worked and Southeast Asia I really enjoyed for, for cycling just because um, people gave me room and maybe because they were more used to um, scooters um, so they, they were looking out for a bicycle so I absolutely love cycling in Southeast Asia um, and so Vietnam is interesting just to find out more about the history what would say for example the Vietnam War um, and they had coffee shops all over the place. So you'd be cycling along, there'd be loads and loads of coffee shops, and they'd all have hammocks there. So there was always the opportunity to have, um, as well as to have a midday snooze whilst having a coffee or some sugar, sugar cane uh, juice. 
Um, as I said, I was in the south, so that was the Mekong Delta. Um, so there were um, markets on the water. So one morning I got to go out and uh, see them, see the markets on the water where people are actually trading um, on the water. And I absolutely love the food in uh, Vietnam as well. So um, next country was Cambodia. So Cambodia I struggled with because um, it was, well, partly because I was having to do 60 miles every day. So um, the, the towns and cities were a lot further away. So every day I was having to do 60 miles. Um, it, and so there was one day where I really didn't want to ride. And I think I'd only been like about 10 kilometers and I really didn't want to ride, but I had to, the whole, I was on a bit of a schedule. I had to get to Bangkok to catch a flight. So, um, and there was one day where this, I, a lot of the kids, you can see on the middle, um, in the middle picture, um, the kids are riding the bikes. And so a lot of the kids are riding bikes and the bicycle on the left, if you notice, um, there's actually a little girl on the back of it. So they had little saddles on it. Um, but the, it was the little things that, that made a difference. So there was one day where I overtook this young lad on his sit up and bed and I was just riding past him. And then I looked in my mirror and noticed that he was right on my wheel. So obviously I, my, my competitiveness came into it. So I started pedaling faster and he was still right up behind me. So I was pedaling faster and faster and faster. Then he overtook me. And so I was trying to chase him. So it was the little things like that that also kept things going. And so um, when he turned off, we had a good laugh and wave, even though there was no sort of like um, verbal communication. And it was things like that that just kept me going. I was laughing for ages um, afterwards. Um, Cambodia also, there was a lot of construction work, as you can see from the picture on the right hand side. And I also went at a time when it was um, quite dry. Um, so it was just a lot of dust. And I suppose, especially being on a bicycle, it just means to say that you get all the dust. So I, it was, I just had a lot of grit in my mouth for a lot of the time whilst I was cycling as well. But also Cambodia was interesting because it was, um, it was all, well, all of my journeys were really interesting just to find, finding out all about um, the different histories of the country. And I remember when I was younger, hearing a lot about the Khmer Rouge, maybe when I was about six or seven, but not really, really understanding what it was exactly. So, um, and as some of you know, it's, it's um, quite a sad, sad story so it was visiting the killing fields this was a pic this picture on the left um, is a building from the killing fields um, to learn a lot more about the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot and um, it is something that you notice about um, Cambodia where um, there's people of a certain age group so um, say yeah my I'm 50 so people from like late 40s and upwards where there's just not as many people of that age group in in the population um, because of what happened um, during um, that time when Pol Pot was was in uh, was in power. Um, I I yeah. And so one of the um, one of the tourist sites in uh, Cambodia is Angkor Wat, and I actually didn't get there. I was because every day I was cycling and I was doing sixty miles, and the roads were really potted. So of course there was one, I was only a day away and I got a saddle score. Um, but I, and so I just didn't ever make it to Angkor Wat, which is one of their um, sites to be seen. Um, but yeah, I had saddle score and I just had to rest up um, because I had to get to Bangkok for a certain time to catch a flight. So I didn't have the luxury of being able to hold out for a few days and then go to Angkor Wat. So, um, and then this one is a photo of my bicycle in a, a hotel room. And this was, I suppose this was a whole thing with the whole journey where it was like, I brought my bicycle with me and the worst thing to happen would be if it got stolen. And so it was sometimes turning up to places and, and asking if they've got somewhere where I can put my bicycle in. They'd be like, yeah, just leave it outside. And they'd be like, no, 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 no. And it would be sometimes, and they'd be like, well, there's no, there's no lift or anything and I'd be like don't worry I can carry it up to the flights of stairs and so um, a lot of times my bicycle would end up in my in my room so it would be having to be a bit of a prima donna about it and feeling quite bad about being a bit of a prima donna about it but making sure that it was safe and secure um, so um, I also went to Indonesia I went to Indonesia twice my first time that I went to Indonesia I went to Lombok and also Jakarta. And I didn't go to Bali, 
um, I was told it's very, very touristic. So I thought I can, I can skip out um, Bali. And then my second time I went to Sumatra up here. Um, so, um, the, so Lombok, um, I went there after they'd had some, they'd had an earthquake on the island and it was the Gili Islands and it was it, it devastated the island, especially the north of the island. And um, at, at that time, I'd also ha was experiencing trouble still with my ankle. And so I thought, I had a word with myself and I thought, no, I've got to rest it. So I rested up for three weeks. And I stayed in the south of the island and I went there during the high season. So the weather was fantastic. But because, um, because of the earthquake, there weren't that many tourists there. So every day it would just be ambling down to the beach. And it was a beautiful white beach. I don't think I have any photos of that actually um, in this presentation. It was a beautiful white beach. And just sitting on the beach, reading my book and navel gazing for, for three, well, I think for a month in total before flying to, um, yes, before flying to Job, Job Jakarta in, um, in Java. So when I was in Job Jakarta, um, and some of the, yeah, some of these photos are from Job Jakarta actually. I met this woman in the middle and she was doing, um, so in the photo on the left hand side, she was doing um, a fashion range. She was trying to start a business, coming up with fashion that was more, she, that was modest. She's Muslim and she was trying to find clothes that were fashionable and modest. And so she met me in a hostel and asked if I wanted to model um, with her for, um, from a model. And so I thought it would just be wearing a few clothes, standing in front of a, a white wall and just just smiling a little bit and it'd be done in about half an hour or so. This was like a whole um, afternoon spent um, in different poses, imagining that this was my, my, um, my queendom and I was the queen and just putting myself in different scenarios, which was quite interesting because I was just like, you know, I really just want to smile and go and that's it really. So this is what this photo um, was all about. So um, also when I was in Job Jakarta, this, in the photo on the right hand side, this woman here with the striped t-shirt, that's Arena. And I met her in Job Jakarta. She's um, studying at the university for a PhD. And she was just so nice. She took me to so many places. And whilst I was there, she said, why don't you come to my house in Sumatra? And so um, when she was next in Sumatra, I went to her family home um, in Sumatra and spent, I think, three weeks with her. And she took me around Sumatra. So the part of Sumatra she took me to um, wasn't touristic. Tourists didn't go there. And this photo above was a picture, a, a scene from a part where she was from. It's very, very green, um, which is the pictures that we always see of like places like Indonesia and Bali. And so these are some of the photos that she took. We took in um, in Sumatra with her. Obviously, I was being very silly there. And these are waterfalls, and she took me to an area where people who were in, the locals would go in, go on holiday and visit. And um, we went. I went with her sister. This is a sister here, and joined them on a running club. And I, um, I, it was just great, like to get to run with the local hash house, the Harrier Group. Um, they dressed me up and showed me their traditional houses, as you can see. Um, this is an example of a traditional house, and this is a wedding dress that they dressed me up in. Um, and then this was another tourist place that um, they took me to and I didn't know these people but because I was visiting and they were just so keen to see a tourist there I had a lot of people wanting to have photos with me so by the end of it um, Arena um, here she got a bit fed up of trying to answer everybody's um, questions people would there was sometimes where people would stop the traffic to ask um, what I was doing there and where I was from but everybody overall was really really very very friendly um, so I also went to Taiwan, so Taiwan, the home of the bicycle, and I, the, the thing about Taiwan is it's cycling around the island, that's, um, that's what a lot of people do, they cycle around the island, it's very, very bike friendly, and um, I really, really enjoyed uh, Taiwan, so as you'd expect, um, lots of factories in Taiwan, most bicycles are made in Taiwan, and a lot of things that you use and you have made in Taiwan as well so the west side of the um, yeah the west side of the country is very very um, industrial loads of factories all over the place 
and the, the east the east side is green and lush and um, this is an example of um, the beautiful scenery and and I remember cycling and like thinking I've got to climb over those hills so I did have to climb over those hills but it was absolutely beautiful and um, I met loads of people along the way so this photo in the middle with me and this man that was like on my first day and he um, we couldn't speak we couldn't understand each other but we managed to work out what um, I was doing and he just wanted to take a, he wanted to take a photo with me and so I had a little business card and this is great I had a little business card and I gave him my business card and sort of like I said send me the photo send me the photo and this is a photo that he took of me that he emailed to me but you'd be cycling along and people would be cheering pumping the air clapping thumbs up people would feed me as well so these people here they were so funny I met them at nine o'clock in the morning in a 7-Eleven and um, I noticed their bikes outside and so I took up a conversation with them and it turned out that they were heading west whereas I was heading, heading south and they were on a bike ride but they said come come and join us come for dinner come and join us and um, so I went with them and I started cycling and I had all of my bags on my bike and they were all on electric bikes so it was trying to keep up with them and there was a point where one guy just started to like push me up the hill with his hand on my back and um, because he had an electric bike to help me go um but they were just they were just so funny and it was also funny because it was nine o'clock in the morning and they, they'd started drinking already so when we were leaving they were having to clear up the cans and put them in the bin and like at lunchtime they were like trying to persuade me to have a drink or so. So, um, so I went. I loved. I met so many people. And I, I really, really enjoyed it. And the cycling infrastructure, as you can see here, is absolutely amazing. Um, so these are dedicated cycle paths um, all around the country. Absolutely fantastic. So after Taiwan, I went to South Korea. So I started off in Seoul and went all the way down to Busan. So. I suppose an equivalent of Land's End to John O'Groats, but it's 600 miles or so, um, rather than the, I think, the 1,000 miles or so that Land's End to John O'Groats is. And this was called the Four River Routes that I did in um, South Korea. So South Korea was like my last part of cycle touring. So I was in South Korea, I left in November, so it was getting a little bit chilly. Um, I, Oh, right. after South Korea, I went to America again, and um, I stopped off in Spain and Portugal. But I wasn't doing any cycle touring in those countries. So this this was was like it, this is my last bit of cycle touring, and I I knew that was happening. But South Korea, I um, I loved it. It was the whole cycling infrastructure is absolutely amazing. Bridges that are totally dedicated to to um, bicycles these are all their cycle lanes even if you look and see you've got a tunnel here let's try and make it a little bit bigger. um let's make it a little bit bigger you've got a, t a tunnel here for the train and then you've got a little tunnel here for the bicycle so you don't have to go all around that that um mountain you just go through the mountain um and then just signs like this where it tells you that it's a 10 percent incline and how far you've got that incline for um, I was there during autumn, um, so the leaves were absolutely beautiful. And because it was the Four Rivers route, I was cycling along the rivers, and the scenery was absolutely stunning. Um, hotels, so I stayed in, um, I stayed in a variety of different accommodation. Um, they had also what they call manless hotels or the hotels where, if you see this little box on the left-hand side, so you drive into the garage and the garage door goes down you you then walk up the stairs and at the top of the stairs is this little box on the wall and um you put money in it depending on whether you want and the amount that you pay depends on whether you want to stay for three hours or to stay overnight and so it means to say that nobody can see if your car's in the garage and the door is down nobody can see who's in there and so this is an example of um, one of the love hotels. And what I loved about South Korea was that they had underfloor heating as well. So you pad around and your feet would be nice and toasty. So let me see. Zero. Okay. And so 
my total distance cycled for the two years, eight months and nine days was 7,058 miles. Um, slightly, like when I worked it out, it was slightly less, a lot less than what I would normally do if I was at home in the UK um, commuting. Um, but I suppose I did, I did distances that meant to say that I could stop and stare and take my time and take it easy. So next one, um, bicycle maintenance. So um, before I left the UK, I was lucky enough to be able to spend some time with Billy from Billy's Bespoke Bicycles. And every Saturday he'd let me uh, come into his shop, ask stupid questions um, about bike maintenance. And so he was able to show me basic bike maintenance and so that I'd have an idea as to what was going wrong with my, my bicycle. He also showed me how to box my bike up. So the photo on the left hand side, if you look in, let me try and um, expand that. Um, you can see I carried this laminate um, with photos of um, for my whole journey and um, it's got uh, instructions and pictures of how to put my bicycle um, back into the box. Um, I, what was really odd was over the um, two and a half years, I got through two sets of ped, well, three sets of pedals. Um, I, you can see that it's one of them snapped there. And um, it, I was able to, for example, change my um, bike chain, um, gear cables. Um, what I, whilst I was there, whilst I was away, um, I had to get new wheels, but that was more because of general wear and tear. And, my bicycle, I think I've had for about six years um, before I actually started the tour. So moving on. My favourite countries. So I had quite a few favourite countries. Indonesia, Malaysia, South Korea, Taiwan, Tonga and Vietnam. Um, I absolutely loved these countries and um, a couple of them I've visited more than once. Best experience. My best experience, visiting Tonga, of course and also visiting Sumatra in Indonesia. Next one, best cycling in infrastructure. Um, South Korea and also Taiwan. Just um, the fact, for example, that South Korea had tunnels going through mountains so that you wouldn't have to go around it. Um, and it was, it was beautiful, fantastic scenery. Best food, best food had to be South Korean. Um, here's a picture of it. Um, it was just the whole variety, all these small little dishes and all the different flavours and their sweet potato la latte were, tasted so good. So scariest mo moment, my scariest moment, that was more because of my um, blaseness with navigation. Um, so normally I, I navigated with um, a Garmin, so a bicycle GPS, and really I would just put my destination in and then just follow it and not really look at where it was actually taking me. So one day it took me through a palm tree plantation and um, there was just nobody around um, and it was the fastest that I pedaled. And I think you can, I could see that there was a road near to where I was. So I started trying to pedal towards the road and I got there and then I realized it was the airport runway. It was the same runway. And um, obviously luckily there was like um, a, a fence between me and the, the runway and it was also saying to myself okay there's nobody around but there are no mass mass murderers do not hang out in isolated places also so that was the scariest which really i suppose was still a little bit funny at the time so um so yeah transportation of my bicycle um it was easy in a lot of countries as you can see on this top picture um that my bicycle's on a rack and a lot of countries like Canada, America and parts of Australia, they had racks on the front of the bikes that you could just put your bike on. Um, and this was fantastic. And different countries like Malaysia, for example, um, parts of America, I could put, I could actually take my bike on a bus and other countries it would be taking it on a train, um, which is so much easier than say here in the UK where in most cases, if you take your bicycle on a train, you've got to book it in advance and um, there's a limited number of bicycles that can go on the train. So I found transportation of my bicycle really easy. And then also, um, as I said earlier, I spent some time learning how to box my bicycle up. And this is me in Taiwan biking to the, to the airport with a box that I've gotten from a, a bike shop. And this is my bicycle 
photon on the left showing it in bits and photon on the right um, showing it finally put together. So um, last one is just pictures, um, well, just um, my website with my blog, which has got further details of the different things that I, I did. And also um, the website at the bottom, if you Google me on that one, you'll also find um, details of an interview that I did recently that gives you um, a summary of, of my trip in total. So thanks very much. And uh, if you've got any questions, please do ask.